us today. If you'd like recording access, please send me a chat. If you'll have a question for coach, please send me a chat. Um, we'll get right into it. So whoever wants to start can go ahead. Emily, go for it. Hi, Coach. Um, I was just curious. There's a real chance our eyes are, are messed up, but I don't think we saw Samo or Ami Finau when we were out there Tuesday. Are, are they okay? They're okay. They're okay. Uh, Sam was a little under the weather that day, so he was inside. And Ami was getting, had a doctor's appointment, but they both practiced Tuesday and Wednesday, uh, or Wednesday and third Wednesday, and they're going to go today, and they'll be both available, along with Mokite this week as well. You guys are counting players now, huh? Try to put them way far away from you in the corner, but oh, Ahmed got all of y'all counting players. We'll go to Jacob. Hey, Coach, uh, last season, uh, stopping the run defensively was, although it was an abbreviated season, was kind of a struggle for you guys. And this season through three games, opponents are only averaging 88 rush yards per game. And I know last season you mentioned gap control is one of the keys to that. So how have you seen growth in that area? And what strides do you want to see the defense make uh, moving forward as the season progresses, continuing to stop the run? Yeah, I think, as I said last year, one of the things that happened, and it would have been second half of Minnesota game one, I thought we started doing a better job of, uh, of stopping the run because we made a commitment to playing man coverage. Uh, we loaded the box up. We added the extra safety down in there. Uh, we found out uh, that we had a talented secondary that could play man coverage, and it allowed us to do that. And so what I feel you see now is we build on that. Um, obviously, you have Mo and Ami, who both are a year further in our program. They both came in as junior college players a year ago where they didn't necessarily get the full off season uh, conditioning and training. And so I think you're starting to see the fruits of uh, those guys going through a full season of how we train and condition our guys and, and they're both playing well, but then also recruiting, um, you know, we've added depth to the front seven. Uh, you see young players like Daryl Jackson out there, Greg Rose has uh, really come on for us and added some, some great depth. And then, uh, as I said before, the one guy that I think has added a lot of value because he was able to add that extra year is Sam, Sam Okwan, Okuanu. Let me say that correctly. Okuanu, who uh, has really been playing well for us along with Lottez Rogers. We'll go to the other Jacob, Jacob Richmond. Hey, Coach. Um, so I was curious about Jay Sean Jones, you know, with such a loaded receiver room, sometimes players can get lost a little in the mix. But I've noticed that, you know, he uh, has been very physical the last couple of games, just getting down the field, making big plays. Can you kind of talk about just what kind of player is for you and how you, you know, enjoy, have enjoyed using him this year? Yeah, I think what you're seeing is a guy that's full speed now. You know, he had the knee injury two years ago when I first got here. Last year with an abbreviated season, it was, uh, you know, it still it takes a full year to a year and a half to get comfortable. Um, you know, he started off a little slow this year. He missed a lot of work in training camp, uh, had a heel injury that kept him from being able to practice. So he didn't play a lot that first game. But what, what you're seeing is what we think he's very capable of doing. Um, you know, he could easily be our number one guy. Uh, he's probably one of the best natural route runners we have. He plays with a physicality in the run game that I just love. Um, obviously, we have to clean up. Uh, where we can't get the 15 yard penalties like you got last year, understanding the new rules. But, you know, he's one of those guys that I think has a chance to, to play at the next level um, as he continues to develop. He's starting to develop the chemistry with the quarterback. Uh, and he's a guy that we go into a game saying, hey, how do we find ways to get him the ball, just like we do with the Demons, just like we do with the Rock Kim Jared? We'll go back to Jacob Steinberg. Hey, Coach, it might be a little early to ask this. I know you guys are only focused on Kent State right now, but how much of a luxury is it for you and your How would you ask the question, Jacob, if you, if you know I'm not going to answer it? Well, I, I think you'll be able to answer it. It just might be right. early to ask is uh, the fact that Kent State played Iowa last week and the fact that you play Iowa next week, just from a, pre a preparation standpoint, how beneficial is that for you and your staff to be able to kind of get an early look at Iowa without, you know, directly focusing on them? Yeah, it really doesn't because when we study it, I know we study Kent State's defense with me uh, working with the offense and what, what we do on offense in comparison to what Iowa does are a little different. So 
we study structure of our opponent that we're playing. We study how they like to align. We study their tendencies and don't necessarily look at the opponent. Now, the one thing that would jump up that I know I always look for when I start studying a defense is how are people getting big plays against them? Because what I found as a coach, you know, when, when people are able to have consistency with big plays, you look to see, is there a scheme or is there a, 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 a personnel issue as to why Kent State gave up the big play? And if it's some scheme issue, we see, hey, we do some of that. How do we how do we get that call to make sure that they've gotten it fixed or they fix their problems? And as I tell our coaches, if you show you can't hit the curveball in baseball, guess what you're going to see pitch wise, the curveball. So we do study some of the things that other people do that attacked or hurt our opponent. But we, we really don't spend time saying, oh, let's take a peek at Iowa's offense right here in terms of getting ready for next week, because we really study the, the opposite sides of the ball more than we do uh, the opponent that they're playing. Thank you. Yep. Go back to Emily. Um, I, I know you've talked a little bit about Talia's decision making, and, and it just seems like that was something he struggled with last year and, and hasn't been as much of an issue this year. Um, is there anything you can pinpoint to, to why he's developed so much um, beyond just having time in the system? Yeah, see, I, again, I, I disagree that he struggled last year. I mean, he threw some interceptions, but as I told you, you look back at the Indiana game a year ago, that was on us as coaches, me uh, included, that, you know, he's a guy that because of his athleticism and, you know, I think that game we, we had three-man routes and they were playing drop seven coverage. So that everybody double covered and we didn't have check downs for him. And so for me, we that, that was not very smart for me as the guy that helps run this offense. And I, I've made the correction. So he's a guy that every one of his plays should have check downs and places to go. I call it, he should have a starting point and an ending point with every play we run. And, and you have to give him an ending point. And I think what you see now is, again, he's game eight, I guess, coming in. This is uh, be game number eight for him as a starter. I mean, you're going to get better when you play. That's what I try to tell you guys. Like, I mean, we're playing a lot of young guys. They'll only get better with each game because the experience of going through some of the learning curves. And, I mean, I hate to see them throw interceptions. I hate to see us, you know, make bonehead plays. But sometimes the only time you learn from it is by failure. And I think that he's really taken a lot of the things from last season, the comfort level he has in our offense, uh, as I've said before, i got to give Dan credit. Coach Enos has done a tremendous job of eliminating Gray from his reads. You know, he's one of those guys that just operates better when you say your movement key is the free safety. If he does this, throw it here. If he does this, throw it there. And if not, get to your progression. Is he open? Is he open? Is he open? And so uh, we've really kind of just worked it, worked it, worked it. And I think he has a comfort level, kind of how he's being coached and what we're asking him to do. But a lot of it is because of the time he spent in the program and having an off season. I mean, again, a year ago, he didn't have spring ball. A year ago, he didn't have summer camp where we went two a days and had meetings all day. I mean, we were Zooming and one practice a day and, you know, separate the whole time. So I just think it's a lot of everything. And then I have one more totally unrelated um, with we talked about it after the West Virginia game, but with all the former players who have been coming back, um, like why, why does that matter so much to you? And it seems like it's something that some head coaches like wouldn't take the time to be personally involved with if maybe you didn't coach those guys, um, even though you've probably coached a lot of them. But um, why, why do you take the time for that? Well, here's a little different for me because, like you said, I've coached and recruited almost all of them, you know, having spent time here since 1997. Um, and then even then, uh, kind of a fanboy of the ones that I didn't coach, you know, when I was here in mid eighties as a fan of the Terps and, you know, the Rick Madonics and the, the Millings and, you know, all these great players that played here. So to me, I just think as a coach, you have to embrace the fact that the history of this program is built on those guys. And uh, I'm a guy that's big on family, big on open door policy you know, this brotherhood or this lineage of players that come through here is something that transcends time. Uh, you know, if you played here in the 60s, you're still somewhat connected to a guy that's playing now because you've represented this great place. So uh, I'm a big believer in, you know, being able to show what our past has been able to do and accomplish in their lives with or without football. And it's great, again, as a, a kind of a way to show our current players, like, man, we've got some successful guys too. And I think it also helps in recruiting when you look out and see a Stefan Diggs on the sideline for the game and 
and you got a bunch of recruits in the stands and they said, man, he must have really enjoyed his time there. So uh, fortunate that I have relationships with a lot of these guys from my time being here for 14 seasons uh, and hope we can continue to do that. Does anyone have anything else for Coach? Ahmed, why are you hiding, man? You got your camera on today. No hiding, Coach. No hiding. All right, just check it, man. Make sure you was really on here. All's good, man. All right, you must have told Emily you didn't see those guys down there. I no, Emily, Emily, Emily did that one all on her own. All right. Well, good, man. We appreciate you guys. See you soon. All right. Thanks, everyone.